Chapter 27. There was anger and argument and a lot of talk about the law, but in the end, they couldn't banish Ares. The fact that Gregor bonded with the bat carried more weight than he had expected. One old man still dug furiously through his scrolls until Vicus said to him, Oh, stop rattling your skins. We clearly have no precedent for this. Gregor turned to his new bat. Well, I probably won't be here much longer. It matters not, said Ares. While I have flight, I will be here always for you. As soon as things settled down, Gregor made a beeline for the hospital. He braced himself before entering his dad's room, fearing he might have relapsed. But when he went in, a happy scene awaited him. His dad was sitting up in bed, laughing as Boots tried to feed him cookies. Hey, Dad, he said with a smile. Oh, Gregor, said his dad, beaming at him. His dad held out his arms, and Gregor rushed into them and held on tightly. He could have stayed there forever, but Boots was tugging on them. No, Gigo, Dada eat cookie, she said. The nurse told her to make me eat, and she takes her job very seriously, said his father with a smile. You feel okay? asked Gregor, not letting go. Oh, a few square meals, I'll be good as new, said his dad. They both knew it wasn't that simple. Life would never be the same again, but they would have their life back, and they would have it together. Gregor spent the next few hours just hanging out with his dad, Boots, and Temp, who came in to check on the princess. He wouldn't have asked his dad about his ordeal, but he seemed eager to talk. That night, the night I fell, I couldn't sleep. I went down to the laundry room to play a little saxophone. I didn't want to wake anybody. We fell from there too, said Gregor, through the air duct. Right. The metal grate just started banging up and down out of nowhere, said his dad. When I went to check it out, I got sucked right down here. See, they have the strange phenomenon with the air currents. And his dad went on for 20 minutes about the scientific aspects of the current. Gregor didn't know what he was talking about, but it was great just to listen to him. I was in regalia for a couple of weeks, and I was just going crazy missing you all. So one night, I tried to escape with a couple of flashlights and a BB gun I found in the museum. Rats got me before I made it to the waterway, said his dad, shaking his head. How come they let you live? asked Gregor. It wasn't me. It was the gun. After I ran out of ammo, they closed in on me. One of them asked about the gun, so I just started talking a blue streak about it. I convinced them I could make them, so they decided to keep me alive. I spent my time making weapons that I could use, but that fell apart when the rats touched them. A crossbow, a catapult, a battering ram. Lucky thing you showed up when you did. I think they were beginning to suspect I was never going to make them anything that worked twice, said his dad. I don't know how you stood it, said Gregor. I just never stopped believing I'd get home again, said his dad. A cloud came over him, and he had a lot of trouble getting the next question out. So, how's your mom? Probably not too good right now, said Gregor, but she'll be fine once we get you back. His dad nodded. And you? Gregor didn't talk about any of the bad stuff, just the easy stuff. He told his dad about track and school and playing a saxophone at Carnegie Hall. He never mentioned spiders or rats or what he'd been through since his dad had disappeared. They spent the afternoon playing with boots, trying to make each other eat, and often, without any particular reason, reaching out to touch each other. Dulcet showed up eventually and insisted boots and his dad needed rest. So Gregor wandered off into the palace, feeling happier that he had in two years, seven months, and he no longer cared how many days. He was done with the rule now, for good. Even if times got bad, he would never again deny himself the possibility that the future might be happy, even if the present was painful. He would allow himself dreams. As he was making his way back to his bed, he passed the room he'd been taken to as a prisoner the night he'd tried to escape regalia. Vicus was sitting at the table alone, surrounded by piles of scrolls and maps. His face lit up when he saw Gregor, and he waved him into the chamber. Come, come, we have not yet spoken since your arrival, he said eagerly. How does your father? Better, much better, said Gregor, sitting across from Vicus. And the princess? said Vicus with a smile. She's good, no more fever, said Gregor. For a minute they just sat there, not sure where to begin. So, warrior, you leaped, said Vicus. Yeah, I guess I did, said Gregor, grinning. Lucky Ares was there. Lucky for Ares, too, said Vicus. 
Lucky for us all. Know you the rats are in retreat? Merith told me, said Gregor. I believe the war will soon be at an end, said Vicus. The rats have begun to battle one another for their throne. What about Riprind, said Gregor? I have heard from him. He is assembling a party of rats sympathetic to his cause in the Deadland. It will not be an easy task to take leadership of the rats. He must first convince them that peace is desirable, and that will be a long struggle. Still, he is not an easy rat to ignore, said Vicus. I'll say, said Gregor. Even the other rats are afraid to fight him. With good reason. No one can defend themselves against him, said Vicus. Oh, that reminds me. I have something for you. Several times on the journey, you made mention of your lack of a sword. The council asked me to present you with this. Vicus reached beneath the table and brought out a long object wrapped in a very thick silk. Gregor unrolled it and found a stunningly beautiful sword studded with jewels. It belonged to Bartholomew of Sandwich himself. It is the wish of my people that you accept it, said Vicus. I can't take this, said Gregor. I mean, it's too much. And besides, my mom won't even let me have a pocket knife. This was true. On Gregor's 10th birthday, his uncle had sent him a pocket knife with about 15 attachments, and his mom had put it away until he was 21. I see, said Vicus. He was watching Gregor carefully. Perhaps if your father kept it for you, she would allow it. Maybe. But there's another thing, said Gregor. But he didn't know how to say the other thing, and it was the main reason he didn't want to touch the object in front of him. It had to do with Tick and Treeflex and Gox. It had to do with all the creatures he'd seen lying motionless on his trip back. It even had to do with Henry and the rats. Maybe he just wasn't smart enough. Maybe he doesn't understand. But it seemed to Gregor that there must have been some way to fix things so that everybody hadn't ended up dead. I pretended to be the warrior so I could get my dad. But I don't want to be a warrior, said Gregor. I want to be like you. I have fought in many battles, Gregor, said Vicus cautiously. I know, but you didn't go looking for them. You try to work things out every other way you can think of first, even with the spiders. And Rip Red, said Gregor, even when people think you're wrong, you keep trying. Well then, Gregor, I know the gift I would wish to give to you, but you can only find it yourself, said Vicus. What is it? asked Gregor. Hope, said Vicus. There are times it will be very hard to find. Times when it will be much easier to choose hate instead. But if you want to find peace, you must first believe and be able to hope that it is possible. You don't think I can do that, said Gregor? On the contrary, I have great hope you can, said Vicus with a smile. Gregor slid the sword back across the table to him. Tell them I said thanks, but no thanks. You cannot imagine how happy I am to deliver that message, said Vicus. And now you must rest. You have a journey tomorrow. I do? Where? Not back to the Deadlands, said Gregor, feeling a little ill. No, I think it is time we send you home, said Vicus. They put a bed in his dad's room that night so that he and Boots could sleep close by. Now that he was going home, Gregor began to let thoughts of Lizzie and his grandma, and most of all, his mom, come back into his head. Would they still be okay when he got back? He remembered his talk with Vicus and tried to hope for the best. As soon as his dad and Boots had woken, they were taken to the dock where Gregor had made his escape the first night. A group of underlanders had assembled to see them off. Ares will take you to the portal above the waterway, said Vicus. It will be a short distance from there to your home. Merith pressed a handful of paper into his hand. He realized it was money. I took it from the museum. Vicus said you may need it to travel in the overland. Thanks, said Gregor. He wondered exactly where the waterway gateway was in relation to his apartment. He guessed he'd find out soon enough. The way is safe now, but do not tarry. As you know, things can shift quickly in the underland, said Solave. Gregor suddenly realized he would never see these people again. He was surprised by how much he would miss them. They'd been through a lot together. He hugged everybody goodbye. When he came to Luxa, he thought maybe he should just shake her hand, but he went ahead and hugged her anyway. She actually gave him a hug back. It was a little stiff, but then she was a queen. Well, so if you're ever in the overland, drop by, said Gregor. Perhaps we shall see you here again someday, said Luxa. 
Oh, I don't know. My mom's probably going to ground me for the rest of my life just to keep me safe, said Gregor. What means this ground you? asked Luxa. Never let me leave the apartment, said Gregor. That's not what it says in the prophecy of Bane, said Luxa thoughtfully. What? What's that? asked Gregor, feeling panic rise up in him. Did Vicus not tell you? It follows the prophecy of Grey, said Luxa. But I'm not in it. Am I? I mean, I'm not, right? Vicus, said Gregor. Ah, you must depart directly if you mean to catch the current, said Vicus, slipping the backpack with boots onto his shoulders and leading him to Ares, who was already carrying his dad. What aren't you telling me? What's the prophecy of Bane? insisted Gregor, as he felt himself lifted onto Ares' back. Oh, that, said Vicus dismissively. That's very vague. No one has been able to explain it for centuries. Fly you high, Gregor the Overlander. Vicus gave Ares a sign and he spread his wings. What is it, though? What does it say? Shut up, Gregor, as I rose into the air. Bye-bye, Temp. See you soon, said Boots, waving cheerfully. No, Boots, no. We're not coming back, said Gregor. The last thing Gregor saw as they left the palace was Vicus waving. He wasn't sure, but he thought he heard the old man say, See you soon. Down the river he went again, but this time he was flying over the foaming water on Airy's strong back. They soon reached the beach where he'd encountered Fangor and Shed. He caught a glimpse of the blackened ground where the fire had been. Ten minutes later, the river fed into what was either a sea or the biggest lake Gregor had ever seen. Giant waves rolled across the water surface and crashed onto rocky beaches. A pair of guards on bats appeared and escorted them over the water. Gregor didn't see any rats around, but who knew what else might be down here looking for a meal? He caught a glimpse of a 20-foot spiked tail as some creature flipped it out of the waves and then dove. Not even going to ask, he thought. The guards held their positions as Ares began to ascend into a vast stone cone. At the base, it may have been a couple of miles in diameter. A strange, misty wind seemed to be blowing them upward. Must be the currents, thought Gregor. Ares flew in tighter and tighter circles as they ascended. He had to close his wings to squeeze through the opening at the top. Suddenly, they were zipping through tunnels that looked familiar. They were not built of stone, but of concrete, so Gregor knew they must be almost home. The bat landed on a deserted stairway and nodded his head upward. I cannot go on further, said Ares. This is your way home. Fly you high, Gregor the Overlander. Fly you high, Ares, said Gregor. His hand wrapped tightly around Ares' claw for a moment. Then he let go. The bat vanished in the darkness. Gregor had to help his dad up a long flight of stairs. There was a stone slab in the ceiling at the top. When Gregor pushed it aside, a wave of fresh air hit his face. He pulled himself out, and his fingers found grass. Oh, man, he said, hurrying to help his dad out. Oh, man, look! Moon, said Boots happily, pointing to the sky. Yes, moon, little girl. Look, Dad, it's the moon. His dad was too winded by the climb to answer. For a few minutes, they just sat in the grass, staring up at the beauty of the night sky. Gregor looked around and realized by the skyline that they were in Central Park. He could hear the traffic just beyond a row of trees. He slid the stone slab back in place and helped his dad up. Come on, let's grab a cab. Go see Mama, Boots? he asked. Yes, said Boots emphatically. Go see Mama. It must have been very late. Hardly anyone was out on the streets, but a few restaurants were still open. It was just as well since they made a funny sight, all dressed in their underland clothes. Gregor flagged down a cab, and they piled into the back seat. The driver either didn't notice or didn't care how they looked. He'd probably seen everything. Gregor pressed his face against the window, drinking in the buildings, the cars, and the lights. All those beautiful lights. It seemed to take no time at all to reach their apartment. He paid the driver and added a huge tip. When they came to the front door, his dad pulled out his keychain, the one Gregor had made him from his pocket. He fanned out the keys with trembling fingers and found the right one. For once, the elevator wasn't broken, and they rode up to Gregor's hall. They opened the apartment door softly, not wanting to wake anyone. Gregor could see Lizzie asleep on the couch. From the bedroom, he could hear his grandma murmuring in her sleep, 
so she was okay. A light was on in the kitchen. His mother sat at the kitchen table, as still as a statue. Her hands were clasped together, and she stared fixedly at a small stain on the tablecloth. Gregor remembered seeing her that way so many nights after his dad had disappeared. He didn't know what to say. He didn't want to scare her, or shock her, or even give her any more pain. So he stepped into the light of the kitchen and said the one thing he knew she wanted to hear most of all in the world. Hey, Mom. We're home. The End